He was a medium of physical effects and of uh, intellectual effects. Dislocating from his body, the out-of-body experience of, you know, being a trance and having, having those visions. He went into a very deep place and discovered he could do medical clairvoyance. He could be a healing medium in itself and he was also transmitting receiving messages as well through him. And give uh, the same way Edgar Cayce did in the 20th century, um, exact uh, medical diagnostics and prescribed cures. He was actually a phenomenon. The journey of my own life has been from the common level of birth to the summit of a commanding hill. The first position reached, I saw a valley before me, and beyond this, a greater hill for my feet to climb. So many parts of his youth were, were, um, were difficult. You know, he had, uh, he had physical problems. There was an accident when he was a child. He was run over by a wagon and left a kind of, uh, you know, internal injuries and so on, left him weak. His father, you know, was kind of disparaging of his physical weakness. Um, didn't think he was going to amount to anything. And he, it was the kind of thing that he heard with repetition from his father. His mother, on the other hand, had a kind of, uh, you know, from, by his reckoning, a, a primitive spirituality, but it was genuine. And, and she thought that he was going to actually make something of himself. At the age of 12, if I'm not mistaken, it was when he was already hearing voices and being clairvoyant and when he told his, his father that they had to move to Poughkeepsie. His time in Poughkeepsie, his, his father, uh, uh, they moved uh, numbers of times um, from one financial stressful situation to another, etc. And uh, it was very difficult on the family uh, growing up. So a number of... Uh, uh, a number of times when um, you would have thought he would have given up on, on, uh, on things because, you know, it was that difficult, um, but he didn't. My mind was more self-possessed and intelligent at such times than during the day, and my eyes, whether open or shut, I know not, could see things about me with greater accuracy. In short, I had to go through a certain sleeping process in order to become as bright and quick-witted as other boys of my age. And then at the age of 17, he tried to be hypnotized by the famous mesmerists. Nothing happened. There were traveling mesmerists um, around North America at that time. That, uh, some were educated in France and some were educated here and then began to um, travel around and practice. Most of it was done as a healing practice in those days. But in the following year, not only he was able to get into those deep trances where he was going to be receiving so many messages, but also they say that in the same year was that year that he all of a sudden woke up 40 miles away from where he was. I mean, how he was there, how he arrived there, if it was a what we call in spiritism a bicorporeity phenomena, which can happen as well. We don't know. Uh, that was a power. That was all very powerful. It was like an epiphany, you know. And he became aware. That was also the the time we he got the magic staff. He got that sense that he needed to be level with all things, not get upset over over things in his life, not get overly excited in a positive way, but also. Um, um, not let himself be drawn down by, by negativity. I beheld a strange, transparent sheet of whiteness on which was painted glowing words that seemed to burn and beam and brighten amid the silent air. Calmly, I read the radiant words, Behold, here is thy magic staff. Under all circumstances, keep it in even mind. Take it. Try it. Walk with it talk with it, lean on it, believe on it, forever. The first stage was the somnambulic stage where he was put in full trance, he did the medical clairvoyance, and that first book came through, Nature's Divine Revelation. Shortly after that, he had this other epiphany where he realized that he no longer needed somebody to put him in a trance, that he could go into that state and stay conscious. 
and retrieve any information he wanted at any time. From all of that, we see that he had a lot of faculties. He was a very special medium. I think it was this second or third person that try, attempted and worked with him. He went into a very deep place and discovered he could do medical clairvoyance and, and give uh, the same way Edgar Cayce did in the 20th century, um, exact uh, medical diagnostics and prescribe cures. Now I could see all the organs and their functions, the liver, the spleen, the heart, the lungs, the brain, all with the greatest possible ease. The whole body was transparent as a sheet of glass. The one is uh, attuning with the mind of the other incarnate and grabbing that information from the mental field of the person and bringing it to light. And in that regard, we could say that's also something that was happening to Davis, if that is the case. He wanted to learn more. He wanted to be sure and to have the expertise and to work according to the law as well. He was very careful with that. So, I mean, it's, it's extraordinary when we think about all the length he went through in order to to achieve uh, or to be capable of using his mediumship even better. He went to medical school not because he um, needed to. Um, from what I understand, my reading of his biography is that he wanted to give more credence to that particular school because he believed in what they were teaching and what they were doing. On a daily basis, he was going into these states of consciousness for several hours at a time. Um, and he was doing service work. From what we can uh, l learn, even from, from his, the book from Mr. John de Salvo, Dr. John de Salvo, actually, we learned that he used this gift for a very good purpose to enlighten others, to help others, and uh, he never allowed himself to be limited by everything that he had to struggle to go through in life. Davis was truly visionary because he had the integrity, he had the understanding, which at the time people didn't put together, reasoning with spirit phenomena. So he was quite bright at the time, but he is a forerunner for us as spiritists. He is a forerunner. He came before the time spiritism was actually codified and founded. He, he never stopped trying to learn, trying to achieve more or accommodating. And sometimes, you know, I think this is something that we should be thinking or considering about which is sometimes, you know, a medium, especially if you are a potent medium, as they say, they can be very accommodating, you know, not going after knowledge, not knowing, not going after, you know, understanding more what is happening to you. And then I think that Andrew Jackson Davis not only did that in terms of trying to understand more of what was going on with him in, the, in relation to the psychic, mediumistic phenomena, but he also wanted to improve himself, the, the person, Andrew Jackson Davis, to become the, better, uh, uh, the best instrument that he could be. The thing that I love most about Davis is his bottomless curiosity. And I think that's really important in spiritual life. I think we've got to keep asking questions. And if anything doesn't suit us, we got to ask that question harder. The rational mind will not deny that man begins life in total ignorance, not knowing anything. Absolutely the surface of the human soul must be a blank book, an unspotted sheet of paper, so to speak, on which the pen of experience has never traced a line of thought. So Davis, after these, after about two and a half years, he's given the instruction that he's, he's supposed to get a group together. He's supposed to sit and um, um, details about um, uh, the cosmos, if you will, you know, another cosmology would be coming through. And so they did that. And, uh, and, and it, 
it was about a, a little more than a year of the whole process. The first book uh, came out, it was called Nature's uh, Divine Revelation, A Message to Mankind. And basically what it was, a, was doing was bringing together the un, science and spirituality. Even from, from the way he received the, the, the book, the first book, uh, that was a deep trance when he was dictating. Very, I, I think it's very similar as we can see uh, that particular faculty in the case of Edgar Case, another phenomena in terms of uh, is, uh, uh, medium, mediumship in this, in this country as well. The medium himself as a spirit needs to have a matrix, a foundation, for such vocabulary to come true. So we would say for sure he was prepared, sometimes not in another life, but in the spiritual realm before coming here. That's another, another possibility. But for sure he was uh, a very good filter if the mediumnistic part is taken um, as the center stage to explain so much of the diversity and the depth of the teachings he brought in. And his descriptions of the solar system were absolutely remarkable. He was a, a medium that could have out-of-body experience. And as a medium of out-of-body experience, which means I can travel far from my body with my spiritual body, uh, he didn't need necessarily a spirit to be reporting to him what was going on around the earth, but he could go there himself. Well, Neptune was discovered like six months after he talked about it by, another, by an astronomer, but he talked about it before the actual physical discovery. Yeah, it, it's absolutely phenomenal when you think that he did not have the advantage like today. We, we've seen evidence of all this stuff. And so if we get in, inputs from, um, from spiritual beings, we can kind of make sense of it. But he had no, no background like that. And yet he was able to bring scientific understanding to it. To say for sure that this particular experience was a result of uh, out-of-body experience, we cannot say that for sure, but uh, definitely it could be a possibility. It could be also his clairvoyance. Or a third possibility, because we live in a computer era in which we have holograms, we have virtual communication. So, spiritually speaking, they could have been presenting to him the very picture, just like we see in a computer today. And then, once it's presented, he would have been able to, to do what he did. Yeah, there's evidences of, particularly in Nature's Divine Revelation, there's evidences of, um, of a lot of modern thought in physics. There's evidences of the Big Bang Theory. That's exciting. And we say exciting because spiritism brings peace to us regarding religion and science. Because there is no contradiction. We can understand the evolution of ourselves and the evolution of the physical body as things that happen in parallel and actually in collaboration. The day before the Fox sisters broke loose on the, uh, on, on the scene with the news and everything, he had the dream and he knew something big was about to happen. About daylight this morning, a warm breathing passed over my face, suddenly waking me 
from a profound slumber and I heard a voice, tender yet particularly strong, saying, Brother, the good work has begun. Behold, a living demonstration is born. What happened with uh, for the Fox sisters? I mean, of course, they were extremely important, important to be mentioned actually as, you know, the ones that are going to be disclosing and that phenomenon to call the attention of people. But then just calling the attention of people, just uh, inciting people's curiosity is not enough. that the Fox sisters had their role more as announcers and Davis as the one who could not only validate it, confirm or prophetically say this was going to happen, but also to break down rationally uh, the spirit phenomena that were happening through them. He engaged um, uh, frequently with all the spiritualists in North America. From 1840s until probably, I would have to go through the Civil War even. The um, Professor De Salvo here in his book, he even mentions the possibility uh, which he thinks it's a great possibility that uh, both Abraham Lincoln, the President Abraham Lincoln, and Andrew Jackson Davis have met. They live it at the same time. They share the same ideas. Uh, they were both uh, uh, abolitionists, for instance. And, um, and of course, being President Lincoln so much interested in the, you know, in knowing more in the afterlife and his wife even more having had sessions or seances in the, 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 the White House, one can only assume that uh, this meeting between the two of them actually took place somehow. My sense is, if Davis, if uh, Lincoln met with other spiritualists, and we know he did, um, although there's a, a concerted effort on the part of historians to, to blame it on his wife, to right. say that his w crazy wife, it's only his crazy wife, he never would have done it on his own, only his crazy wife. However, if you read the accounts, um, particularly one by Nettie Colburn, um, who was uh, a medium uh, who came down from Connecticut or something and she actually held seances in the White House and she talks about his um, coming to her afterwards and saying I have no doubt that you are um, bringing through important things. Certainly for the gravity of the situation he received help whether intuitively or ostensibly through the seances that they had at the time through his wife he actually was warned by the medium, by a medium at the time, that he should go and do what he had to do, which was the emanci Emancipation Proclamation of the time. Not only freeing the slaves, but keeping the unity of the country. So we would say that is one of the evidences that we have that the spiritual realm was uh, playing a very important role in the decisions and uh, the steps encouraging those who were in the leading roles to do what they had to do. Pull away from the um, excess attention on phenomena. Okay? And it became much more uh, phenomena driven, the movement, in the latter part of the 19th century. It was really outline some foundational steps for us. And it's not by chance that the phenomena actually were boosting in the United States and were heard in all places of the earth, mainly 
in France. And that's why I think it's very important for us to bring uh, the knowledge about Andrew Jackson Davis again and, uh, and the, the, his writings and see uh, how we can make history with that here as well in terms of spiritualism. And then it's as if they were giving the time to Kardec. Kardec was doing the next step. And from there on, of course, Brazil and everywhere else in the world nowadays. Actually, Kardec, in Allan Kardec, in one of his uh, Spiritist Reviews, this one from May 1864, he mentions that one of the reasons why the spiritual ideas uh, were actually born in the United States was because the United States uh, 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 always preached, preached liberty. Liberty as a principle is not local but general. A liberty man is a man of principle. He looketh upon policy. He preths it's beneath his feet. His struggles and sufferings are not designed to subserve isolated interests. His patriotism is balanced as the earth. I believe in the case of, uh, and we all, we know actually, we know in the cases of, uh, case of missionaries such as Andrew Jackson Daves, he would be having extreme protection, benefactors, mentors guiding him and assisting him because what he was about to achieve in this country was very important. At the time, people didn't know this country was a very new country, uh, but one that since the beginning was founded in the idea of liberty. And what I find is fascinating in um, Davis, something that probably needs to be brought to light to date, is the fact that he was so rational that he was able to do both and give quality work be reliable in his mediumistic work and at the same time keep his reasoning sharp to break down and even understand the phenomena that were happening through him at a time. His, his, his process was that after the writing of Nature's Divine Revelation, which was um, transcribed by other people because he was in full trance, after that he was able to write directly um, without the need of anybody else copying down. And so he was consciously aware of the information he was given while it was given to him and could easily transcribe it himself. So it's not this, even the same as automatic writing. It's of another order. And in, in another passage from the Spiritist Review of April 1862, Alan Kardec also mentions the work to, of uh, Andrew Jackson Davis by saying, we call the attention of our readers for the interesting brochure of Mrs. Clemence Guerin, whose title is Biographic Essay of Ad Andrew Jackson Davis, one of the main spiritualist writers of the U.S. So Kardec would not ask us to go there and to read that if he, was, he didn't have a great consideration from Andrew Jackson Davis. To believe that spirits can overstep the essential boundaries of human intuition and impart knowledge superior to what men can obtain by large talent and large industry is equivalent to a repudiation of the fundamental laws of all development. When, uh, Andrew Jackson Davis talks about the communication with spirits. He also talks here about the different levels of spirits. And he says, it's not because they are a spirit that we have to believe what they're saying. They are our inferior spirits that do not have the level of knowledge to give certain messages to or to, to convey certain messages to us. So he, he was aware of all that. He was aware of the importance of this work and how we should understand how the communication between two worlds, the visible and the visible one, should go through. In this case, Davis was talking about the, he was describing the type of communication that was being received 
the, the identity of the spirits. We could make a parallel in spiritism to the many spirits that Chico Xavier channeled. They say Chico Xavier channeled more than 4,000 spirits. And amongst those 4,000 spirits, certainly we could tell spirits such as Emmanuel come from a sphere different from those like uh, Albino Teixeira and uh, many others. Well, I think it's no, it's no coincidence that uh, uh, Chico Xavier was born the year Andrew Jackson Davis died. I, I'm not suggesting they're the same soul, but I'm suggesting that there's a need on the planet for souls of that level. I think uh, the synchronicity of events in the lives of both mediums tell us something for sure. Though they were living in two different eras on the earth, of course, uh, we could tell that both opened their mediumship, let's say ostensibly, to themselves. They knew they were mediums, but then more related to what they had to do in this life. We need more. We need more attention, though, to the the moral character and the moral fiber that Davis pointed to. It's not just about the the gifts and the skills and the the psychism and all that kind of stuff. Unless we put the moral attent the moral authority first, you know, even in the Bible, it says, "Seek first the kingdom of God." Then all these things they come to you. Then then you have something to be able to use it for. You know. This is the main uh, important aspect. His mediumship, like we, we know, was a tool. A tool for him to achieve this kind of understanding. A tool for him to act as a missionary in this country and to open up our minds and to enlighten us. So we would say without Davis, could we have had spiritism in its clear fashion? just to tease our minds and to see whether or not we can answer that question one day or another, but I think we couldn't because Davis really uh, outlined some foundational steps for us. The thing that is, to me, that is most wonderful about Davis is just the fact that there could be people like that who come to this earth and, and from, from such a difficult background rise to such a great um, and wonderful spiritual height, you know, and to be be able to carry that integrity in his life, and to um, and to gift the world with um, what he discovered, and and what he what he learned. It's interesting because he says here he's only a human being. He may have presented certain aspects according to his own limitations, to the possibilities of his mediumship, regardless of how powerful medium and how many different faculties he had, he was still a human being. And he still had to process all this knowledge with the little knowledge and vocabulary he had at the time. And at the same time, carry this wonderful humility about him. Recognizing, you know, that he's only this one person. He knew it from the get-go. I'm only this one person. Everybody's got to ask their own questions. Everybody's got to do their own trip, you know. Um, and even recognizing that, that he was able to um, express things that very few other people could, are capable of expressing, he still saw himself um, as only another man as only another individual, and that everybody else is in the same ballpark as he is. I know my soul hath power to know all things, yet is she blind and ignorant in all? I know I am one, nature's little kings, yet to the least and vilest things thaw.